Yeah. Okay. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Uh, we're continuing our studies about about uh, what God has prescribed for us in the Bible as our food, right? And what's in Genesis one verse twenty nine? What is the food that is prescribed? The herb bearing seed and the tree bearing seeds in the fruit, right? So the herb bearing seeds. Oh, this is the thing that we're going to study. What is the herb bearing seeds? What is the herb bearing seeds? Okay, right. And why is this important? Because it's the it's the prescribed diet that was given to Adam and Eve. Right? And the, yeah, it's the herb bearing seeds. It's part of the diet. Okay, but obviously after they fell, what were they given also in addition? The herbs of the field which is vegetables, right? Herbs, right? after they fell into sin. Okay. God is working in behalf of his people. He does not desire them to be without resources. And so the most important part right here, he is bringing them back to the diet originally given to men. So this is, we have to move back. He wants us to go back to the diet that he has prescribed, given to Adam and Eve. Their diet is to consist of the foods made from the materials he has provided. The materials principally used in these foods will be fruits, grains, nuts, but various fruits, roots will also be used. Right? And, you know, uh, we read this many times already, you know, the various preparations of rice, wheat, corn, and oats are sent abroad everywhere. Also, beans, peas, and lentils. So this is the, you know, the, the grains and the beans, peas, and lentils, right? Uh, those are the herb-bearing seeds because it's the herb that has the seed. Right? It's not the seed inside a fruit, right? That's like a, that's the fruits, right? That's a nut. Okay, so the grains are the, the, the plants that has seeds coming right out of that plant. So that's an herb bearing seed. Okay. All right. The thing about it is, you know, I was just looking and say, oh, how was the diet, you know, how was the diet during Ellen White's time? And how, why did they have to have a health reformation to return them to the diet that was prescribed in Eden? Right? And it was very interesting to see the diet of the pioneers back then. <laughs> James White was trying to help, yeah, trying to help those interested in reforming their dietetic program, encouraging them to raise small fruits to fill out a diet from which flesh had been discarded. It may be well to pause for a moment. Now, this was written by the the grandson of Ellen White, right? Who write the biography here, yeah. wow. Arthur L. White. Yeah. All right. To fill out a diet from which flesh had been discarded. It may be well to pause for a moment to consider what was involved in 1870 and earlier in changes of diet. When did Ellen White receive the Os Os Oswego vision? 1863, right? So 1863 was that vision in Oswego, in Michigan, about health reform, right? There were no prepared cereal foods such as cornflakes and shredded wheat, except perhaps oatmeal, which was brought, bought at a drugstore by the ounce for those who were ill. There were no skillfully prepared vegetable protein foods, today called meat substitute, not even peanut butter. There were no frozen foods. The selection of what to eat was limited to meat, legume, grain, vegetables, and fruits in season. Some kinds of nuts would, could be had, but they were seldom mentioned. Now, in 1890, John Loughborough recalled the diet on which he grew up as an orphan on his grandfather's farm in New York State. He, his father died of, I can't remember what his father died of, typhoid fever, typhoid. Every autumn, four large fat hogs. Now they live in the in the in the winter area, right? So there's no food in the in the winter, 
right? So what they have to have for food? Four large fat hogs and one cow were slaughtered as winter provisions for that family. Nearly all parts of the hogs were eaten except the bristles and the hoofs, he wrote. I was a, so he said, you know, I was a great lover of fam animal flesh as food. I wanted fat pork fried for breakfast, boiled meat for dinner, cold slices of ham or beef for supper. One of my sweetest morsels was bread well soaked in pork gravy. John Loughborough. This was the diet back then, right? That's him on the right. That's Arthur L. White. If in the spring of the year we felt languor, what, in the spring we've been eating so much meat that we had this like languor. Really the result of consuming so much fat and flesh meat during the winter. We resorted to sharp pickles, horseradish, mustard, pepper, and the like to sharpen the appetite and tone up the system. We naturally expected a poor spell in the spring before we could get newly grown vegetables. Right. <laughs> Without the abundant supply of a great variety of foods known so well today, the shift in diet for those pursuing health reform in the 1860s and 1870s was not simple or easy. Right? How to live, number one, with its 20 pages. They had a cookbook entitled Cookery was helpful, furnishing 13 recipes on unleavened bread, wheat, and corn, four breads made with yeast, 11 mushes, mushes and porridges, 20 pies and puddings, many of them with an apple content, 25 fruit vegetables, counting tomatoes as a fruit, and 34 recipes for vegetables. That was all. You know, so they, they really add ate very bad in those days. Their diet was terrible, right? Yeah. They had to have a health reformation. And it came in 1863, right? When Ellen White had that vision. Right? Uh, John Loughborough turned out that he lived until he was 92. Yeah, he was 92. He died in 1924. He was... Yeah, probably, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing is that, you know, he was... But the amount of flesh they ate, that's incredible. Oh, they could feel the effect in spring. They were so... <laughs> they were such in a haze of eating all that flesh. Right? Okay. All right, so herb-bearing seed. What is the herb-bearing seeds? So we know it's the, it's the grains, right? It's the grains, right? right? And we make it a difference with what we study right now. This is what we've done. So what's the legumes, right? And the legumes are? No, no, the whole plant. Right? That's why I took a picture. This is even way back from the, you know, some Chinese, uh, ancient, uh, drawing, right? The legumes of the soy, soy plant, right? right. Legume, right? The entire plant is the legume. So it, it, we eat the legumes. You, you, you're talking about the whole plant. The stalk, the leaves, the flower, the, what's the bean? Ah, okay. What's the bean? The bean is the pod and the seed. So that's a whole, like a bean. Because like you go, know, the string bean, right? The pod is like an envelope, right? It opens. So a legume is a plant that has a, like, has a pod with, le with, yeah, with seeds in it, right? With seeds in it. So the bean is the, that whole pod with the seeds. That's the bean. Okay? That's the bean. And then what's inside is the pulse. Alright, so that's, uh, so that's the pulse. So, so this, this whole thing is the bean. This, this is the pulse. The whole plant is the legume. 
All right. Okay. Here, here's the. What's the difference between pulse and nuts? Like nuts. The thing is that a nut is a, from a fruit, right? And it has, has a hard shell, right? It's not a, it comes from a fruit tree. So a nut is from a fruit, right? And it has a hard shell, right? This one doesn't have a hard shell. It comes from an herb. It comes from a plant, a, you know, herb that comes, you know, like, yeah, that's a legume, right? So the pulse, the difference between nuts and pulses. Nuts actually is, comes from a fruit. It's the seed from a fruit and it has a hard shell. All right. So my question is, what's a peanut? Is it a nut or is it a legume? It is a legume, right? Yeah. Peanut is a legume. <laughs> Just because it's called a nut, it's really not botanically a nut. You know, we're talking about botany here, you know, yes, yes. the science of botany. This technically, peanut is not a nut. Peanut is actually a legume, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So now that we get this, the diet, yeah, the herb bearing seed is the one that is prescribed in Eden, right? Where's the first mention of an herb bearing seed eaten in the Bible? Well, okay, Genesis, all right, it has to be Genesis. Where in Genesis? Where is the first legume mentioned in the Bible being eaten? Where's the, where's the first legume? Okay. Where's the legume? You gotta find a legume, okay? Alright, I give you, alright. Okay. <laughs> it's right here. Esau and Jacob. Right. I have to look, I have to make sure I look, you know, lentils, any beans, any, any, any beans, any pulses, you know. Daniel diet. Oh, that's way that down the road, right? Oh, that's way down, down. But this is in Genesis. We're talking about Genesis, right? Okay, you gotta read this, you know. The, always the first mention is so important, right? The first mention in the Bible is, well, this is technically not the first mention, because the first mention is what is given by God in the Garden of Eden, right? The air bearing seed. That's the, Eating, yeah. Now, now they're eating this, all right? They're eating this, all right? He's, Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Okay. Now the comparison is venison. Esau gave his father venison, right? And Esau loved venison. Right? What's venison? Deer meat. <laughs> Deer meat. Okay. So Esau loved to hunt. And he he gets the deer meat and he gives it to his father and his father loves deer meat. <laughs> well, they need healthy for me, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, the thing about Jacob is what what does Jacob? Jacob sawed pottage. What does it sawed pottage means? Cooking. Cooking. Yeah. Yeah. Pottage is soup. So, sod pottage means he cooks soup. All right, he cooks soup. It's what zid and nazid. All right, just looking at it, he cooks soup. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, "Feed me, I pray thee, with that red pottage." So it's a red soup, right? It's a for I am faint. That's why his name is called Edom because he's like the red pottage. And Jacob said, "Sell me this day thy birthright." Right? Soup. Ah, there you go. We have to read it, right? Then Jacob gave Esau bread and a pottage of lentils. Soup of lentils. It's a soup lentil 
soup of red lentils, right? Soup of red lentils, right? And he sold it. Yeah, he sold his birthright. Yeah. Now my question is, he comes in and he has meat. Why does he prefer lentils compared to meat? Well, oh, that's another thing, all right? There is more than that. There's more than that. I will figure it out. But, you know, obviously, he's ready. He's already ready there. The other thing is that when you look at, when you compare it side by side, you know, lentils will cause you to be full quicker and last longer than than when you eat meat, right? Yeah, there's the one. But obviously, the the what the easy thing is right there. He's already ready, right? Yeah. So now comes the part where we go. Okay, we gotta we gotta see. Let's let's do the science, right? We'll, we'll have to do science. Oh, right. The thing about it is the story of uh, Esau and Jacob is because Esau is a symbol of those who do not have the power to overcome appetite, right? Yeah. All right. And because of that, he lost his the spiritual blessings of the inheritance of the birthright. Okay, all right. Uh, Christian temperance and Bible hygiene. Right. All right. Now, this is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing here. The American Institute for Cancer Research. Right. What they did, they uh, they looked at half a million of studies, right? And nine independent research teams from all around the world came and made a scientific consensus as to the recommendation to prevent cancer. What kind of foods are recommended to prevent cancer? So they, they put it down here as an official recommendation of American Institute for Cancer Research. The, the, what kind of foods may be related to cancer? The one that is convincing, the only one that's for sure convincing, is that aflatoxins can cause liver cancer. Now, what's aflatoxins? It comes from the poisonous mushroom. That for sure will cause liver, uh, liver cancer, uh, poisonous mushroom. No, no, of course not. <laughs> we cannot die. The, oh, yeah, it's very potent. It's very potent. It's very dangerous. Also, it can cause. Not only that, you'll die a lot. You know, if you don't die right away, you'll take a long time, you'll die of cancer. <laughs> yeah. And there's another one that has strong evidence, but they still, still call it probable is that whole grains will prevent, decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. Food containing dietary fiber reduces colorectal cancer. Non-starchy vegetables and fruit aggregated reduces aerodigestive cancer. Uh, aerodigestive is the lung, uh, oropharynx, stomach, right? and aggregated. Okay, So these are the ones that have strong evidence. And there's uh, some limited but suggestive, right, of non-starchy vegetables, fruits, citrus. All of these vegetables prevent, reduces the chances of, you know, all kinds of cancers. Esophagus, nasopharynx, breast, uh, lung, stomach, bladder. But these are limited because there does not have that much studies to support it. Right? But these have more studies. Have a, you know, it reduces colorectal cancer, aerodigestive cancer, whole grains, and foods with fiber. Okay. So they made an official recommendation here. Okay. Consume a diet that it provides at least 30 grams of fiber. Okay. Most include in most meals. It says most meals should include whole grains, non-starchy vegetables, 
fruits and pulses, such as beans and nettles. It says most meals, to be able to get to 30 grams, most meals need to contain this, right? You have to eat a diet high in, in all types of plant foods, at least five portions of servings of a variety of non-starchy vegetables. Now I was thinking, what's the difference? Now, well, their definition of vegetables is the edible part of a plant, including the leaves, bulbs, and stems, and everything. Right? The starchy vegetables are the potatoes, uh, kamoti, you know, uh, you know, ubi, and uh, yeah, do uh, cassava and all that. The non-starchy vegetables, also the green vegetables, and all that, you know, the kind of things. But there, it says in most of your food every day has to include legumes and vegetables. Now, now this comes from the American Institute of Cancer uh, Society. You know, it's pretty. And it says limit consumption of fast foods, right? Limit consumption of food high in fat, starches, or sugar, including fast foods. Yeah. See this this is after half a million of studies, you know. And, you know yeah, it's it it takes a long time to make uh recommendations like this and they have to be very conservative when they actually make it, you know. Uh, knowing all the, th but it's now there's more and more and more evidence now, right? Of what to eat, fiber and legumes is very important. Okay, let's see epidemiological studies. You know how in the society, uh, you know what what kind of uh, societies? Uh, there's now this, this uh, in 2004, legumes is the most important dietary predictor of survival in older people of different ethnicities. In Japan, Denmark, Greece, uh, Australia, right? They see, they see that legume intake, right? It reduces the risk ratio down to 0 0.92. Reduces the risk ratio 0 0.93, if you uh, stratify it, you know, as compared to all the others, it is the, 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 the food group that has, lowers the, you know, makes your, uh, right, prolongs your life the longest, right, in elderly folks, compared to fruits, cereals, dairy, meat, fish, right, even monosaturated versus saturated ratio. Legume intake is the most important dietary predictor right? for those to live longer. So if you want to live longer, right? legumes. Right? Okay. The higher legume intake is the most protective dietary predictor of survival among the elderly, regardless of their ethnicity. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Here's another one from Taiwan. Right. The cox they compared men and women who had a bean-free diet. What happened? Bean-free diet showed the increased hazard ratio for all cause mortality among women. You have a 2.0, uh, about two times as higher risk of dying if you don't eat beans in women, right? So now let's look at the beans, right? So we're, we're talking about legumes and now pulses, right? I'm going to ask you to s compare these beans, right? So they, they did these beans, compare these beans, all right? Right. Okay. I this antioxidant activity, right? 
This is the anti the how much the concentrated, which one has the highest antioxidant activity, right? This one has the highest antioxidant activity. They compared like how many? 10 different beans, all right? Which one has the highest antioxidant activity, right? If you were to compare the beans, all right? Now let's go from lowest to highest. Let's try to rank these. You know, mung bean, navy bean, chickpea. Do you know the red kidney, well, red kidney bean versus the small red bean? I don't know, I've never, I don't remember eating a red, small, small red bean. Oh, oh, I see. I see. The cowpea. I don't remember the cowpea. I obviously know the lima bean. We eat a lot. And pinto beans. Okay. All right. Let's rank these. All right. Which one you would you see, you think would be the lowest? All right. It's difficult to f figure out, you know, to compare these. Okay. The lowest is actually a navy bean. Yeah. Yeah. The navy bean. I um, mean, there. Navy bean. Okay, that's the lowest. Although it does, it does have antioxidants, but it's kind of low, right? So if you were to choose, you would choose the ones that are the highest ones. Okay, which one is still low? The yellow one. Okay, let's look for the yellow one. Which one is the yellow one? Lima bean. Lima bean. Okay, which one is the purple one there? Chickpea. Chickpea is kind of low. Chickpea is kind of low. Ah, yeah, all right, there you go. <laughs> okay, let's see which one next. Cowpea. Mm -hmm. And then what's next? Mung bean. Mung bean is kind of like in the middle here. Mm -hmm. Mung bean. All right, now we go. The small red bean. And then the red kidney bean. Okay, the, the three highest one, which one is, would you say would be pinto, lento, or black bean? <laughs> which, which one is lowest among these three? Black bean. And then, and then pinto here. Which one is the highest? Lento. Lento has the highest antioxidants of all these beans. So if you were to get, a, you know, all these beans are good, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want the highest no. amount of antioxidants? There's red lentil, green, and brown. Mm -hmm. And brown lentils. Right. Maybe so I actually, I actually put that there. I said, okay, there's different kind of lentils, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, according to this, this is the amount. That one actually had the activity. They actually put it against some copper and see which one actually will uh, neutralize the copper. This one, they, they, this is based on the amount of uh, uh, antioxidant. Over here, they say pinto beans is higher than lentils. But there's the, the potion lentil versus the green lentil, right? Potion lentil is higher than the green. But it's, you know, what I did not realize is the pinto bean is very good in the antioxidants, right? Even the activity and the amount, pinto beans. So if you were not, you don't have any lentils, you know, uh, you know, try to get pinto beans because they're better than, you now we, we all like the mung bean, right? Yeah. But it's kind of low. Yeah, it's common. Yeah, but the pinto bean. What about soybean? 0.99, still pretty good. Yeah, the the peas uh, kind of low, mung bean, right? But it's still they have it. They still have it. All right. Yeah. So out of this, lentils, you know, lentils still, and pinto beans. I, just from these slides, you know, lentils and pinto beans. That's what you need to concentrate in getting eat eat more. All right. <laughs> Right. Okay. 
So why is it so good? What's in it that makes it so good? Well, this, this uh, lentils and pinto beans, these legumes, what is in it, all right? Okay. Now, the thing is that when you say what makes it so good, you can't just ask it directly like that. You have to say what's in it that's good compared to what, yeah. right? All right, because all are good, but compared to what, all right? Let's compare it to rice and... Um, <laughs> and eggs, <laughs> and rice and eggs. All right. <laughs> because because I remembered from last week, you know, Auntie Doreen goes, "Oh, compared to fried rice with eggs, well, that's like our staple breakfast used to be <laughs> back home. <laughs> that's a fried rice and egg, right? Okay, let's compare lentils versus fried rice. <laughs> Not fried rice, rice and eggs." Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> you want data? Here you go. There's the data. All right. This is lentils. All right. One cup, which is 200 grams of cooked lentils. All right. Look at this. Compared to one cup of brown rice. I didn't, not white rice. This is brown rice, which is better. Okay. Compared to 200 grams of eggs. You gotta get four eggs, right? Now you, you see, because you have to base on weight. Okay. You can't just say one egg, you know, but one egg is only a quarter of a, you know, okay. it's like, yeah. You have to weight against weight, right? Mm -hmm. Not volume, weight against weight. All right. Calories? Hmm, pretty similar. A little bit more for the eggs, right? What about the carbs? Oh, look at eggs. No, really no carbs, right? No carb. Rice? Oh, it's got a lot of carbs, right? What about fiber? Oh, right here, this is where it wins. Fiber. Fiber is where it wins, right? You know, half of, essentially almost half of the carbohydrates is fiber. This? Oh, red rice? It's kind of low, right? What about protein? Obviously, here is more. But look at lentils. It's still very good, right? Yeah. What about the fat? Oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. 20 grams of fat. And this is, we're talking about four large eggs though, 744, cholesterol, right? And look at the vitamins, look at, you know, in percent of daily, I think daily variance or something like that, DV, how much a day you need. You know, vitamin B, 28%, vitamin B3, vitamin B6, folate, folate 90%, right? Vitamin B5, 20%, 25%. Right? Look at rice. No vitamins. Look at all the, look at the phosphorus, potassium, zinc, copper, ma manganese. This calcium 2%, iron 5%, potassium. You know, rice, even though we tout brown rice as good, it's really... It's nothing compared to lentils. Yeah, it, it does have it does have vitamins, right? It does have uh, you know. So, but what what's gonna get you? This is what's gonna get you. Even the protein, fat and the cholesterol, right here. This is what's gonna get you. So just looking at this, you know why now rice? Just looking at the numbers, kind of falls down. I mean, it's really. Yeah. It's less rice. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> you, you see, <laughs> you know, the thing about it is, if you just need starch, okay, right? If you just need the carbohydrates, maybe okay. But even that, you you don't get any vitamins, no. you don't get any, fi the fiber is really yes. kind of low. Man, lentils is just, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so compared to rice and bread versus legumes, what is the effect on your blood sugar? All right, what's the effect of legumes versus rice and bread on your blood sugar? All right, this is an hour after, you know, between half an hour to an hour after you eat like grains. Uh, you know, grains, which is rice, bread and pasta, tubers, even what? Even tubers. But compared to legumes, look at legumes. Right? It does not rise. Your sugar does not spike. The sugar does not spike. It remain. It it goes up, but at a much slower rate. Right? Much slower. Uh, it does, it does go up, but it's not as much, you know, even if you were to count it, it's legumes raise it about 18 milligrams for your blood sugar as compared to eating rest, you know, even grains or tubers. Tubers is like yam and uh, potatoes and all that. Yeah. It still goes up. Yeah. Legumes, legumes are, wow. It's, it's much better, right? Okay. Glycemic index, right? This is where you, you're talking about glycemic index. Legumes has much lower glycemic index than the tubers and the grains. Mm -hmm. Tubers is, uh, the ones in the ground, in the tubes, the makes tubes. Ubi, potatoes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cassava. Those are tubers. Those are good. But still, the glycemic index is higher than legumes. Legumes, I can tell you, legumes, legumes is a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> chickpeas. Chickpeas is legumes. Right? Okay. All right. So look at this. This is in 1980. They already knew this. 40 years ago, we conclude from our results in the Leguminous seeds as a class produced by far the lowest rise in postprandial blood glucose. Right? Of the carbs. Okay. All right. Let's compare beans with white rice. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, this is, no, the thing is what? They needed to do some, a study, all right, of what, uh, in South America, which is, then they chose Costa Rica. The problem is, the thing about in, in South America, people eat a lot more beans. beans yes. The problem is that as in the modern society, they move more away from the beans and more, go to more toward to white rice now. As people become more modern and live more in the cities for some reason. And they say, what's the effect of this? Okay. What's the effect of this? Yeah. So they, they, the beans, the ratio of the beans compared to the white rice, right? There's now more white rice than the beans. No more white rice than the beans. What happens? Right? They say the the blood pressure goes up, metabolic syndrome goes up, blood pressure goes up, cholesterol goes up, weight goes up, right? When you substitute white rice for beans, right? Increasing the servings of beans. Now, if they were to go back to what they used to eat, they said, you know, was associated with a lower diastolic blood pressure. Moreover, substituting one serving of beans for white rice was associated with 35% lower risk of metabol metabolic syndrome in Costa Rican adults without type 2 diabetes. 35% risk. What's metabolic syndrome? Combination of several, right? Yeah. There's multiple risk factors for developing diabetes and heart disease, right? Metabolic syndrome. Okay, we'll go to the numbers, right? They actually have numbers for this. Comparing when you eat beans and white rice. If you were to reduce your white rice 
and more beans. You know, what will happen to your waist size? <laughs> Goes down. What happens to your systolic blood pressure? Goes down. Diastolic blood pressure goes down. HDL goes up. What about triglyceride? Goes down. What about glucose? Goes down. That's all the parameters for metabolic syndrome. It, these are the metabolic syndrome, right? Yeah. And it is, all of them are improved with beans compared to white rice. Right? So you said, oh, it's a plant food. But you know, you have to be able to choose. There are better plant foods, you know. There are the good, the, and the best, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, you know, we know that, uh, you know, Esau, when he was hungry, he says, uh, you know what, I'd, uh, I'd rather have lentils, right? I even sell my birthright for that lentils because that lentil is filling. Now, why is it filling? <laughs> All right. There you go. This is called the second meal effect. Wow, this, I, I didn't even know this before, right? So what they did, what they did was that they, they did, what they did is they gave a person for their first meal, right? So they gave a person for their first meal, all right, some bread and some lentils. They compared, okay. For the first meal, you get bread, and then another group, they get lentils. Four and a half hours later, they gave them another meal. And they see how much food is still in the stomach or with that second meal. Because in that second meal, if you're, the food is digested slowly, means you're, you're not as hungry as much and you don't absorb as much, right? Because of what you ate in the first meal, right? So in your first meal will affect your second meal, right? And your first meal actually could make you less hungry for your second meal. It, they found that when you eat lentils, even with your next meal, you're less hungry. You tend to eat less. Your blood sugar is actually less when you eat lentils. And they this call this the second meal effect. All right. See this? They, those who eat bread, you know, the amount of food in their stomach is lower than those who eat lentils. Before, it affected the meal in the second meal. It made you more satiated. It makes you feel more full, even for your next meal. Not the current meal, but for your next meal. That's the second meal effect. And they actually called it the lentil effect. Right? But it's not only just lentils. It turns out it's the slow digesting fiber. That's the, the main reason for this. Right? And it's, it's the fiber that actually does this. Right? So they, they said, you know, the digestive products of starch in the distal ileum, right? So here's the stomach. It goes to the duodenum and then goes to where? Jejunum and then ileum, right? And then here it goes to the colon. This is the colon, but this is the cecum, right? So your food goes down, right? Food goes down here, yeah? And then it goes to the duodenum and then the jejunum, right? And then it goes to the ileum. When it gets to the ileum here, it actually, right, here, the food that is here, the starch that is here, two or three times as potent in inhibiting gastric emptiment of solids in the same product in the jejunum, right? This is more powerful in inhibiting food from going through, right? So he said, well, we need to di di digest this first. Don't send us more food. Slow down, right? We still need to digest this fiber. This fiber is slow to digest, right? Slow down, right? That's, that's how fiber works. It makes you <coughs> satiated. It fills you up, right? So make you eventually eat less, right? It's pretty amazing. But how does it do it? 
So they compare. <laughs> you know, I, I look at these studies, you know, how did they think of these? It's pretty amazing. Right? They've done this for a long time ago, even in 1982. They compared those who eat bread and those who eat lentils. This, was, this is what happens to the blood glucose. Those who eat lentils, the blood sugar goes up like this. Right? But those who eat bread, boom, it goes up and goes down. Right? Right? We want, this one is better. Yeah? This one, you make more insulin. And that's not a good thing. You know, when your body has to produce insulin too much, you know, that's a, that's a, some bad effect of it. Okay, all right. This is lentils. This is bread, all right? Okay, now they, they compare this with another meal afterwards. The same meal, the bread and lunch, all right? This is, len this is lentils and this is bread, okay? All right. What happens at lunch when they eat the same thing, they eat bread again at lunch. They, this, they eat the same thing. One group eat lentil for breakfast, the one group eat bread. And for lunch, they both eat bread. What happens to their blood sugar? Right? Uh, this is like four, you know, four and a half hours later, five hours later. They both eat bread. Look at the effect of blood sugar is lower compared to eating bread, even for this meal, right? It affects the second meal, right? So if you needed to fast, if you needed to uh, needed to do intermittent fasting, yeah, you know, it's good that you eat a lot of fiber. Lentils, you're gonna last a lot longer, right? Yeah, it keeps you, it makes you feel, yeah. It does not make you hungry as fast, right? They already proved this, and your blood sugar is lower too, right? And your insulin level is lower, right? All, all of these are good. Okay, second meal effect. Okay, what about Dinner even to the next day. So they gave, <laughs> right. So this is at dinner. They gave somebody just plain glucose. They just gave some plain glucose. And then the other one, they gave lentils. And then they keep doing lentils because they look at lentils. Wow, lentils is really good, right? They, they, they look at the blood sugar doesn't go, you know, it doesn't go up. This glucose just keeps going up. And then they wait for a whole night, right? And then in the, in the morning, right, they have breakfast. And the breakfast is the same thing. They give glucose again, right? They give, and what happens to the blood sugar? Okay, let's see what did they give in the, um, okay, all right? Okay, all they give is just glucose here. This is no lentils. All they gave was just glucose, plain glucose, right? Those who ate lentils, their rise is slower. Can you imagine the lentils that you ate the day before still affected your blood sugar even the following day? Mm -hmm. That's how powerful, but how? So people go, Wait a minute. Okay, that's good, but how does it do it? Okay. All right. They said this is colonic fermentation. There's something about colonic fermentation. So they found out that it's the short chain fatty acids in the legumes. Now, what are short chain fatty acids? It's the breakdown of fiber. When fiber is broken down by the gut bacteria, it's turned into short chain fatty acids. Right? It's only produced in the colon, right? Because germs are in the colon, right? Yeah. Germs are in the colon. So the, when the fiber gets to the colon, that's when it's turned to short chain fatty acids. And this short chain fatty acids somehow actually causes the gut, uh, you know, uh, to slow down, to relax, right? You know, the amazing thing is how did they actually do this? 
they give rectal enemas of short chain fatty acids. And then they found out when they give the gut, actually something in there is absorbed and turns the gut to become slow. It makes the transit time in the gut slow. This short chain fatty acids. You know, they, they noticed when they give the short chain fatty acids, it's the short chain fatty acids that is a breakdown product of the, of the fiber, right? It actually affects, it goes into the blood and affects the stomach, right? So something, it's the, the secret is in the short chain fatty acids, right? Okay. They found that, uh, your blood glucose does not rise. Actually, it rises a lot later, right? And your insulin level rises a lot later. As a matter of fact, when you look at the curve, you know, the area under the curve, the, your glucose is much less, your insulin is much less, and your transit time, you know, your the food is digested longer in your stomach, right? Yeah, it's digested lo the because the the food you know the your your stomach is bigger. Yeah, it is bigger. It does not empty as quick, right? It's bigger when you eat the lentils. Yeah. The, when they actually we conclude that ingestion of bread with sodium propionate, right, lowers your glucose and your insulin. Right? Then does ingestion of bread without sodium propionate. What's sodium propionate? Propionate is the breakdown of fiber. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of science here. All right. Here's fiber. It's broken down by the bacteria in the, in the intestines into short chain fatty acids. Right? And the short chain fatty acids are acetate propionate and butyrate, right? This is very important because we found out that these short chain fatty acids will affect the gut, uh, will affect, affect the stomach, make the stomach f feel full, make the stomachs of uh, food uh, stay longer, all right? And what they found out is butyrate, right? butyrate is the food for the colon. This is something that I didn't even know before. Butyrate is the butyrate is the breakdown product of fiber. And that is actually the food for the colon. Colon uh it di directly it directly absorbed by the the cells of the intestines as food, right? Butyrate is the preferred food for the colon, right? All right. Another thing they found is that butyrate actually affects the immunity of the body. Okay. Butyrate here, it works on these macrophages, the immunity cells, and it says, calm down, right? Do not fight these bacteria. Because if you have immunity cells in your body and you have these germs in your colon, your body will want to fight it. But butyrate actually down-regulates such that your inflammation to fight these germs are reduced. So your body can live with these germs because these germs are giving you good... Actually, these germs are beneficial for you. It's giving you butyrate. So butyrate says, okay, no, 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 no. Let's not fight these germs because these are the good germs. It's giving you butyrate. So your inflammation level goes down. And this is why, why they think this is the reason for Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease. There's so much inflammation because lack of fiber, lack of butyrate, because butyrate down regulates all this inflammation. This, they believe this is something to do with the, the Crohn's disease, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, right? And butyrate. And butyrate here, this butyrate is the one is the most uh, studied. You know, it's very important because it's the preferred food for the colon. And it's, so when we feed, uh, and when we feed on the fiber, 
right? We're feeding your the colon and your increase improves your immunity because you're not fighting. You know? The the intestines are not as inflamed. Alright? Okay. Alright. Ah, we, we've done this before, but I just want to go uh, quickly uh, remind of when fiber was fi finally figured out as being beneficial, you know. It was on, it's only in the 1960s that uh, Dr. Burkitt, who was a, a physician in, uh, uh, from England in Africa, he says, wait a minute, how come the Africans have so much less diverticular disease, irritable bowel syndrome, appendicitis, varicose veins, hemorrhoids, diabetes, obesity, dental caries, atherosclerosis, than the people in England. And then when they, from Africa, they move to England, then they have the same diseases. It's the fiber. So he gave this, this fiber hypothesis. And we found out that only 5% of Americans have enough fiber in their diet, right? Okay. All right. And fiber, right? The dietary fiber, which includes whole grain intake, affects the glycemic index and glycemic load, right? All these affect the, affect the risk of mortality and incidence of non-communicable diseases, right? The diseases that are non-communicable, like, here, uh, all-cause mortality, coronary artery disease, Diabetes and colorectal cancer. All of them, it, you know, it's your dietary fiber and your whole grain intake that will reduce your mortality from these non-communicable diseases. This is the epidemiological studies, right? Yeah. All right. And how much do we need? For women, 25 grams. For men, 35 grams. The problem is in a lot of countries, we see, right, like in, uh, this is Guyana, this is Jamaica, Seychelles, America, the average people only eat 14 grams of fiber, right? And because of this, right, they only get, only 3% of Americans get enough fiber, right? And because of this, there's a, the obesity goes up. The diet, if in the society the diet goes, the fiber goes down, obesity goes up. Metabolic syndrome goes up. Obesity goes up. Diabetes goes up. Hypertension. When fiber goes down, right? Yeah. Only between three to five percent of Americans have enough fiber in their diet. You know, in Jamaica is nine percent. In guy, um, I think this is in Ghana, 43% in Africa. All right. Okay, this is the one that I had to quickly find out. What, what, uh, yeah, what uh, group of people has the highest uh, lifespan in the United States? White Americans, Black Americans, or Hispanics? It turns out it's Hispanics. What What is incredible, you look at this thing, is, you know, there's this paradox, right? The paradox, right? Be, even those Hispanics who have, who as a, as a group have the lower socioeconomic status, lower income level, lower educational level, lower health literacy, quality of health care, insurance cover, uh, coverage, lowest Medicaid coverage, right? And the lowest barriers to health care and even language. Their mortality is better. Incredible, right? There's this paradox. How could it be, right? Yeah, and they didn't even know. 2014, mm. a result of favorable social dynamics. What explains the Hispanic paradox is still to be determined. <laughs> yeah. All right, no, no, no. 
All right, uh, let me go. This is pretty sensitive here, I think. Yeah. Even, right, the interesting finding that Hispanics have the longest life expectancy among the three main ethnic race groups in the U.S. Thus, in despite of the negative cardiovascular disease risk profile, right, their, their profile is not very good, right? But they have the longest life expectancy and low socioeconomic status, right? represents a major opportunity. Say, so let's figure it out. Okay, what is it? The time to spill the beans, right? So what they said, <laughs> they said, what is it that they eat? All right, look at uh, the Hispanics, right? They had less lung cancer. Bladder cancer. These are the Hispanic is red, and the non-Hispanic whites are blue here. Right? Uh, American Asian green. Hmm. Yeah. But this American Asian green here's there. Look at. Yeah. Still, they're lower. For the most part, they're lower than all the others. Right? Stomach cancer, hepatitis, all these cancers, they're lower. Even despite their poor uh, socioeconomic status, right? Poor medical, poor educational status, not relatively talking, right? As a general, right? And then, uh, you know, lung cancer, lung cancer, COPD, probably. And uh, look at beans. They eat the most beans, twice as much beans. All right, it's pretty amazing. And they actually did this with COVID also. They have a very low, mort lower mortality than all the others. Uh, I actually didn't have that, but I saw that and go, oh my, look at that. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is the microbiome, right? Microbiome. Uh, it basically, Prevotella versus Bacteroides is kind of thing. The 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 groups. Microbiome is basically your diversity of gut organisms that is very important in health. You know, the thing is that if you eat, you eat the plant, you know, the flesh foods, you tend to build up more of the bacteroides, right? You have more of the bacteroides, yeah, as compared to the Prevotella group, right? Yeah, and and bacteroides is more of the we call it the bad, right? Versus Prevotella is like, kind of like the the good bacteria. You will ha always have bacteria, but you need a predominance of the good bacteria. Yeah, good bacteria. Right now, if you eat uh, you know plant boost, what happens is that you have a lot more, a lot more germs, a lot more bacteria, because if you eat one gram of uh, vegetables or plant boost, you make two grams of stool and most of it is bacteria so you make a lot more bacteria and a more diverse all kinds of bacteria because you're eating all kinds of fruits right as compared to eating just like four types of meats you're eating like a hundred different you know like 50 different kinds of plants right so you have much more diverse right and you have more of the kind of like the prevotella Right, the, more of the good germs, right? Okay. So, and then we found out that the, you know your inflammation is less when you eat more of the right pol saturated monounsaturated and polysaturated fat intake have a significant your in, your C-reactive protein your inflammation markers are all less, and we know it has something to do with the butyrate. Right? It actually affects your macrophages to downregulate your inflammation level. So you have less of these inflammatory bowel diseases, less Crohn's, less, you know, all these, less inflammation. That's always good, right? <laughs> right. And you need 30 grams, you know, and it will reduce your CRP levels. Right? 
CRP is your CRP is the C-reactive protein, the inflammation. And when we want, uh, if like uh, you know, I ha I'm in the hospital, I order it a lot. You know, wherefore I'm trying to figure out what's what this. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of inflammation that's going on in your body, right? Mm -hmm. Measure. You can measure. And those who eat a lot of fiber, they're low. Yeah. Because one of the reasons is because the butyrate, that is the breakdown of the fiber, actually down regulates your, your response, right? Against the bacteria in the intestines, right? All right. Okay. So we did this, right? Yeah, this is butyrate, okay, all right. Butyrate is actually the food for the, for the colon cells. Yeah, it, it feeds here, right here. But also, oh, sorry. Also, it affects the immunity. These are the immunity cells. These are the macrophages, right? These macrophages down-regulates the immunity against these germs. You're saying that we need to live with these germs. Do not keep attacking, you know. Calm down, all right. Reduce the immunity, all right. Reduce the inflammation, all right. All right. Okay. All right. Now here's the kind of like a summary. Right? This is kind of important here. The microbial fermentive activity in the gut are the short chain fatty acids. Remember acetate, propionate, and butyrate. That's the breakdown of the fiber, right? By the germs, by the good germs, right? Butyrate is the preferred energy source of the colonocytes, right? It's what feeds the cells of the colon, right? And it's locally consumed. It doesn't, it's directly fed, right, into the colon, right? Where the, the other absorb, the others, like propionate and acetate, it actually goes into the blood vessel, right? And affects other places, like the stomach, right? It makes your, you know, your digestion in your stomach slower, right? It makes, it keeps you, keeps you from being hungry so fast, right? It's those, that fiber, right? It's that second meal effect, all right? When these fibers are in short supply, if you don't eat enough fiber, what happens? The microbes switch to the energetically less favorable sources of growth, such as amino acids from proteins and fats. So now he says, well, you know, we need food. They have to get it from protein and fat because you don't eat enough fiber. So, hmm, okay, what does that mean? All right. The problem is that it's not short chain fatty acids. It's now the branch chain fatty acids. Branch chain fatty acids are the isobutyrate, methylbutyrate, and isovalerate. Okay. Now, instead of getting butyrate, you're getting the branch chain fatty acids from protein as kind of like the energy source, right? But it eventually can be implicated in insulin resistance. Wait a minute, how? Okay, this is very interesting, but how does it do that? Okay, so we'll have it here. We'll just review this again. Fermentable fiber becomes short chain fatty acid, right? So now you're becoming a little bit more, you know, accustomed to these names. Short chain fatty acids, that's good. It comes from fiber, right? Fiber becomes acetate, propionate, and butyrate, right? through the germs in the gut, the good germs in the gut, like Prebotella, right? the Prebotella group, right? It makes these short-chain fatty acids. Butyrate is the food, right? Butyrate is the food right here for the intestinal, for these to, you know, propagate and make new cells, right? It needs, every seven days it's changed, right? You need food to constantly keep this uh, fresh and healthy, right? right? Now, but if you don't have enough of these, right? And remember, propionate is actually goes into the in stomach and actually tells the stomach to slow down. Right? 
What happens if you don't have enough of this? You start using protein. Now protein is broken down to, remember, long chain, branch chain fatty acids, like isobutyrate, 2-methylbutyrate, and isovalerate. The thing about it is these branch chain fatty acids is absorbed into the blood, into the blood and becomes chylomicrons. You remember chylomicrons? It's fat. These becomes fat and triglycerides and it goes into the body and stored as cholesterol and fat in your body. So if you don't have enough fiber, you don't have enough butyrate, your immunity is reduced, right? You have more inflammation in your body because of the butyrate. And the other thing is that now your body starts taking more of the branch chain fatty acids and turns it into cholesterol and fat that is deposited. And when fat is deposited into your cells, it causes insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and more diabetes. Right? Yeah, well, a lot of science today. You see, the thing is that, you know, yeah. The thing, the thing about it is that, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't even get this in medical school, you know. This is pretty amazing. You know, I have to. We have to learn this ourselves, right? The the thing is that you know, we have to be sealed, and the only way we can get sealed is when truth. What <laughs> truth is uh, given to us and instilled in us intellectually and spiritually. Intellectually, you go, okay, you know what? Um, lentils is better than venison. Okay, I believe that. Lentils is better than venison, right? That's spiritually. Mm -hmm. Intellectually, how do you know? Well, this is why you know, right? So you got to be able to know, understand it intellectually and believe it by faith, right? So that we know. So that we can, you know, have a much healthier life and you know it's actually proven that your lifespan will be longer all right if you eat more beans your life you tend to die a lot less uh, than uh, uh, yeah and the hispanics right it's pretty amazing more beans more and among the beans the best one is Lentils, right? That's why it's the like kind of like the first mention, mm -hmm. right? Now, why is not the Indian, Indian, India, not Indian Native American? Oh, why are they not Indian? Indian uh -huh. they are the highest, the country that produces the most lentils is Canada. It's Canada. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. But they export it a lot. Yeah, yeah. they export it a lot. They they don't they sell Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, maybe people are knowing this more. More people are knowing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of planting rice, I have read a study. This doctor for doing the in the basic cell. Dealing with cancer, um, it's in the metabolic part in, in the cell, you know. And so, uh, with this study, his recommendation is that it's a comprehensive nutritional modification for treatment of cancer, which, of course, is eating, you know, food. 
So that's our study about the herb bearing seeds. I, there's a lot more, but I have to pick and choose. I go, there is so much data, and I have to make. And then you know, oh, doing the making this uh, slides. I really enjoy making this to for me to actually uh, understand it. You know, understand it so that it will make sense, right? Because we have to be intellectually sealed. Right? Not just spiritually. All right, and that is a more sure word of prophecy. All right. Believe me, I actually have to learn a lot more about nutrition uh, by my own studies because I was not taught this in med school. Pretty amazing. You know, in the Philippines, uh, they have a Catholic teaching. And on the table, they have the two